Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's so good that you're here uh, at Orchard Community Church. Welcome to those of you joining us online as well. Um, this morning is World Communion Sunday. And World Communion Sunday is a Sunday when Christians take communion mindful of the fact that our God is a global God, that our God is at work, not just in our church and not just in the church down the street, but all over the world. So as we take communion, we will remember that this fellowship is, is a global one. Would you pray with me? as we begin our service. Loving God, guide our hearts as we worship this day. Let them be filled with praise. Let us never forget the good things you have done, um, the greatest of which is sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help us to remember that you are at work all over this world and right here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. Praise when outnumbered, I praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll praise cause I know you're still in control Praise is a weapon that's more than a sound My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet. I won't be quiet and my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? you're sovereign praise cause you reign praise cause you rose and defeated the grave i praise cause you're faithful praise cause you're true praise cause there's nobody greater than you i praise cause you're sovereign i praise cause you reign praise cause you rose and defeated the grave i praise cause you're faithful praise cause you're true Praise us, there's nobody greater than you. Oh, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let everything 
that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. We're going to slow it down a little bit. This song was written in 1886 in Sweden by Carl Boberg, a member of the Swedish parliament. He wrote about this song. It was in 1885, the time of year when everything seemed to be in its richest coloring. The birds were singing. The trees, wherever they could find a perch, on a particular afternoon, some friends and I had participated uh, in a service, a church service, and as we were returning, a thunderstorm appeared on the horizon. We hurried to a shelter. There were loud claps of thunder and lightning flashed across the sky. Strong winds swept over the meadows and billowing fields of grain. However, the storm was soon over and the clear sky appeared with a beautiful rainbow. After reaching my home, I opened the window towards the sea. The church bells were playing the tune of a hymn. That same evening, I wrote a poem entitled, O Stor Good, How Great Thou Art. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn, 1886. We're still singing it now. Sing with us. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Oh, 
Beautiful, beautiful. Please be seated. Well, friends, as always, you can find a digital bulletin for this service on the Version Bible app. There's links to that in our weekly email and on our website. For those of you joining us online, there's a little button at the top of the page that you can push that'll bring that uh, bulletin open for you. There's also a place to sign in and to leave a prayer request online. For those in person, would just draw your attention to that perforated section in the bulletin. Love for you to pull that off and sign in. Let us know that you were here today. And if there's something that you'd like us to be praying for you this this week. Um, put that on there and we'll do that. We'll uh, lift you up in prayer. Well, as you may have seen from um, the, the uh, weekly email in the Orchard Life, Melinda is preaching today. Melinda has a heart for World Communion Sunday. And so for the second year in a row, she's bringing our message today. Thank you, Melinda. Mm -hmm. A few things to draw your attention to. Uh, five new common interest groups have been started, so take a look and see if there's something that you're interested in. There's also time to start new ones if there's something that really is exciting to you. Coming up in October, we've got the Women's Movie Night on the 13th, the Men's Breakfast on the 14th, and sign-ups are ongoing for the Women's Retreat in February. want to encourage you to go ahead and get signed up for that. There are tickets available on the patio today for the Men's Breakfast, so be sure to grab those. Um, coming up, up, um, in the life of the church next Sunday following the service we have a congregational meeting to elect new elders and deacons and it is always an exciting thing when God raises up leadership for um, a new uh, segment of life here at Orchard so we're excited about that. The prayer and healing guide is still available online. It'll be on the patio and there are copies available in the office during the week so know that you can uh, still get that and it is all leading up to a prayer and healing service on October 19th and we'd love to have you uh, join us um, for that service. Uh, the Kids Ministry, Orchard Kids, has a fundraiser this Wednesday at Blaze Pizza, so we'd like to see you there. As I mentioned, this is a communion Sunday, so a special note to you joining us online that you'd want to gather the elements and be ready to receive communion at just the right time. Um, for those of us here in person, uh, a reminder that you'll uh, come down one of the aisles um, to the station where they're serving communion. Someone will put the bread in your hands with a little pair of tongs, then you reach and take one of the small cups of juice and return to your seat. There's going to be a, a, a gluten-free station to my left and a self-service station to my right. Is that correct? That is correct. I like to make sure that I'm correct in the things that I say. At this point, normally I would turn things over to a Melinda who has a word for our kids. But since she's preaching and doing my job this morning, I'm going to turn things over to myself and do her job this morning. So I'd like to invite all the boys and girls to come forward for the kids' message. Come join me right up front here. Love to have you do that. And I brought props. So, you know, it's always more fun when they bring props, right? That's what I always think. So come right up here. Well, this is a little toy um, that I keep in my office because sometimes when I have moms and dads come and visit, they bring their children and their children get bored I don't know if you ever get bored when your mom and your dad just talk at church and keep talking and keep talking and talking and you're like, I want to go home and they're like, just a minute. Well, and when that happens in my office, I have some toys and one of them is this uh, globe and it's a very special globe because what it, and it, it comes with a bunch of little people. And they are dressed in the outfits of different countries. And the goal of this is to find where you think that that um, little person would come from and to put them on that country with the Velcro. And so it just reminds us of all the different kinds of people that there are all over the world. And today is World Communion Sunday. And so what we want to remember today is that God doesn't just love us. He does. He loves us very much here at Orchard Community Church. But you know what? God loves the whole world. It says that in the Bible. It says, for God so loved the world that he sent. Do you know who? Who did God send? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, for God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. So today, um, second through fifth graders are invited to stay in worship if you'd like to. And uh, because we're taking communion and to be a part of that, but you can also go to Orchard Kids if you'd like to. Um, but we're going to be remembering today that God loves all the people of the whole world um, and, and that his family covers the entire world. 
All right, let's remember that. So you are released then to uh, go either back to your mom and dad or to uh, Orchard Kids. So go ahead, guys. Now it's time for our offering. So if we could have our ushers come forward as Harold plays us a song. Stand and join us. There is a Savior, there is a King, there is a power beyond defeat. This is the good news, His name is Jesus.
with the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, nail tore before you, silence and boast of sin and grace, the heavens are children in here today and I might need your help so children be ready to help me out a little bit well today is world communion Sunday and it's a joyful occasion for congregations all around the world to gather at the Lord's table and um, it's a decades-old tradition and many people that we know here in town are doing it and across the globe so it's a really special day um, there's a picture I have of a table of what I think it might look like. This is just a picture that Anna took at school a few weeks ago from a big gathering. But I kind of picture all of the different congregations taking their little tables and joining them together so the tables kind of wrap around the whole globe. It's a wonderful image, I think, to have. Um, so we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians uh, 11, verses 23 through 28 today. And these are the words of institution, or the words Jesus spoke at his last supper with his disciples. And these are recorded in other places, three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all use these words, and this letter to the Corinthians from Paul. This letter was written before the Gospels, so these are the very first words of Jesus recorded in Scripture with it. I think it's pretty cool. Um, the, the setting for this is that Paul is writing to the Corinthians with some instructions and 
some corrections. Would you want a letter like that? (laughs) Um, The subtitle for this section of scripture in my Bible says, Correcting the Abuse of the Lord's Supper. Dun, 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 dun. (laughs) He has already been there in person, Paul has, and he's reminding them that he's already taught them about the Lord's Supper. So just before this, he has said, shall I praise you? Certainly not. Not the kind of letter that we want to get. Paul is not happy with what he's hearing about the practice of communion among the Corinthians. Not only were there some divisions as, and cliques and things like that from, that we see in other churches, but there were people who were coming to church, and you know how there are some of those people who get there early to church and um, that others like to trickle in? Well, this was going on in that church. And the early birds were apparently getting there and getting into the communion stuff, and they were eating and having so much fun and getting drunk off the wine. And then the ones that trickle in later were like, where's my food? Where's my wine? They wanted to get drunk too, I guess. I don't know. So the meal had come to be about the food, just the bread and the cup, and they'd forgot the meaning behind it. They were thinking about whether or not they were hungry or whether or not they were full. So Paul is writing this part of the letter to set them straight, to reset their attitude, to refocus their attention on the, like off of the actual food and drink and onto the real spiritual nourishment that we all need in Jesus. So taking communion correctly was not a priority for these Corinthians, but it should be for us. Not just a thing that we do that we don't truly understand. The Corinthians didn't bother to understand fully, but that's what we're here to do today, is to try to truly understand what Jesus wanted for us in communion. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning to gather with our church family, mindful of all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are doing the same thing. We pray that as we look at your word this morning, that you would meet us with your Holy Spirit and fill us with understanding for what you truly want from us as we gather at the table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So listen and follow along with me. Paul is the one speaking, and he's quoting Jesus. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was arrested, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Amen. So in verse 23, Paul is trying to say, I've already told you about communion. You should know this. Has anyone ever said that to you? (laughs) I already said that. I told you that before. You just don't remember. Sometimes, even though we hear things, we aren't always tuned in for reception. And that's what was happening. Paul is frustrated because what he had taught them about the Lord's Supper was important to him. And they'd missed it or they'd forgotten. 
So he lays it out for them again, and he begins to quote Jesus, who had been sitting at the Passover table with his disciples. And Jesus holds up the bread and the cup. And kids, do you remember what the bread and the cup represent? If you do, tell some... Oh, you got it. The body and the blood of Jesus. So he holds those things up. And if you're new to Orchard, know that some traditions believe that the bread and the cup become Jesus' literal body and blood. And some traditions believe they are merely symbols. And we believe that they are the signs and seals of the real spiritual presence of Jesus with us when we gather at the table. In verse 24 and 25, listen for words which repeat because we know that when something is repeated, it is important, right? So verses 24 and 25, the words that Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. What were the words that were repeated? Do this and in remembrance. So let's take do this first. Do this and remembrance. Do this. This is the reason we do it because Jesus said do this. <laughs> this is why we do communion. Um, it's one of our two sacraments, baptism and communion, and it's because Jesus said do it. Um, so it's like a mom calling her family to the table. Do you remember the tone that your parent took when they called you to the table? Was it ever kind of meekly like, honey, um, maybe would you possibly be interested in coming to the table and maybe having something to eat? No, right? No, our parents were clear and to the point, do this, come now, come to this table. And that's the tone that Jesus is saying, come, do this. Well, our responses probably had some variety to them when our parents called us, right? If you were hungry or just a plain, weird, obedient kid, you probably came right away and sat down at your place, or maybe you were in the middle of watching TV or uh, video games or you were with your Legos and you said, in a minute, but you really meant like 10 or 15 minutes. Or maybe some of you stomped to the table and you were in some sort of rebellious obligation as you sat down to grace everyone with your presence and you're like, fine, whatever, right? Right? Hmm, I wonder how that relates to us spiritually. So Jesus has called us to his table, and how do we respond? Are we all in? Are we ready to focus on the bread and the cup, on Jesus? Are we showing at the table out of routine, out of obligation, dragging our feet? Let's just get it done, move on with the day. Jesus said, do this, come to the table. The goal of communion is to come together to God. Not a dry ritual or obligation, but to have a real spiritual moment together. The truth is that it's just easy for us not to come that way. Let's look at in remembrance. So we did do this in remembrance, the other words that Jesus repeated. Not only does Paul want the Corinthians to remember, but Jesus wants us to remember. What does he want us to remember? He wants us to remember the truth about him. Picture him. We know what was happening that night in hindsight. What did he want us to remember? The truth. The gospel story. If you're new to Christianity, here's the simple, plain story. That God created everything out of nothing. And God made people. And the very first people he made messed up big time. Because one of the things God gave us was a brain to choose well or to choose poorly. And once those first people messed up, 
that was called sin. And for generations and generations, we are living in a, in a sinful condition. So then God sent directions that were clear for the humans so that they would know exactly how to behave toward God and how to behave toward one another. There were 10 of those specifically clear directions. Anybody remember what those are called? The 10 commandments. And then we were all perfect, right? Once we knew the rules? No, we kept messing up and kept messing up and sin was just everywhere. And so then God sent the prophets. Dun, 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 dun. Nobody wanted that job. The prophets came and they reminded us what God wanted from us. They tried to set us straight and warn us to follow God's ways. So then we were perfect, right? Finally, God himself came in the form of Jesus. And Jesus lived the life that we could live from. He lived a life that we could follow to show us the way to live. And he died a death to rescue us, to redeem us, to take away the sin that had separated us from our perfect God. And then God sent his spirit to guide us and move in us. And um, he does this when we cannot move ourselves. And I've experienced that, where the Holy Spirit just fills in the gaps for where I can't do it, right? So we still mess up, but here's the good news, the truth. We are already saved. We're already forgiven, and we're already promised a room in heaven, all because of the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus wants us to know he died for us. He wants us to remember that communion is seeking to be with him, saying, I remember what you did for me. I remember that it was terrible. It's terrible that you had to die. But it's wonderful that you loved me that much. That you loved me that much to give me this grace, forgiveness, and life. To me, this is the greatest truth that we can know for ourselves and pass on to others. What an amazing act of love to remember. In verse 25, when Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant, this is reminding the disciples of their Hebrew heritage. They would have all known around the table what the old covenant was from the Old Testament Hebrew history, when people could only approach God through priests and animal sacrifices. But animal blood did not remove sin. So forgiveness didn't last, and sacrifices had to be done again and again and God is the only one who can remove sin completely through the sacrifice of Jesus once and for all. Jesus died in the place of sinners. And now this cup that he's holding is the new covenant which offers freedom from that sin and also eternal life. So now people can approach God directly because God sees us through the lens of what Jesus did for us. Jesus' last meal was the Passover meal, a meal to celebrate and remember way back for the Hebrew people when God rescued them from slavery um, to the Egyptians. Do you kids remember that part? When God rescued the Hebrew people yeah, and Moses was their leader. If you remember something that God did that was miraculous to rescue the people, tell the person next to you. And now at this meal, which Jesus knew was his last meal, with his friends, and it's before his death on the cross, not only is this a reminder of the rescue of the Hebrew people in this Passover meal, Jesus is foretelling that this meal will remind them of what was to happen next. That God will again rescue his people from slavery and death 
This time the slavery is to sin and the rescue from death leads us to eternal life. What an important meal. No wonder Paul was so upset. The new covenant, God has rescued us from sin and death through Jesus. Jesus wants us to remember why he came for us and what he did. Verse 26, Jesus says, whenever, everybody say whenever. <laughs> whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup. That means he wants us to do this again and again, repeatedly. God knows we are humans and we forget what we're supposed to remember, right? We forget. And Paul wrote this passage because he knew the Corinthians had forgotten. And so, um, Communion is set for us in our congregations to do not just once, but repeatedly so that we continue to remember and get called back to the table to remember what Jesus did for us. Some churches have uh, traditions of celebrating every single week. And some churches are once a year or once a quarter. And uh, Orchard has chosen to celebrate communion together once a month because we want to do it often enough so that we remember and don't forget. But we don't want to do it so often that it becomes routine and less important. In verse 27... Paul says, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. Yikes. So these are Paul's words now, and he's addressing the problems in the Corinthian church with their divisions and their cliques and with their careless attitudes of eating and drinking and communion. And he warns us to be careful and mindful when we celebrate communion together. So in our day, what might be an unworthy manner of coming to the table? I haven't seen anybody get drunk here in the mornings, so I, don't, I know that's not the issue. But to this table here in Orchard, what might be an unworthy manner? So I have an image of people eating TV dinners. Remember those? So you're sitting in front of the TV and you're eating your food. Well, some of us might approach communion kind of the same way. We are people that we gather together, but we're distracted. We're watching something else. We're not focused on each other um, or the meaning of the meal. We're just individuals sitting by, side by side, maybe watching a show. Are we thinking about other things while we're celebrating communion? Are we taking the elements, but just watching the show? Next image for you, a drive through Maybe this one hits home for some of us. I don't know. We like to eat and run without any inconvenience. Do you ever try to get into church and out of church with as, much, as little interacting as possible? Anybody ever been there? So this person has um, ordered their food, paid for their food, received their food, and probably only talked to three people maximum. If we have that kind of attitude about church gatherings, especially in sharing communion, we are not understanding the communion. The word literally means to come together. In communion, we not only come together with Jesus, but we also come together with others, and that was important to Jesus. Later on in verse 33, he says, Paul says, whenever you gather to eat, you should all eat together. The togetherness part of communion is super important. Some of you know I worked in Scotland a, lot, a long time ago, and one morning I got in the car with my lead pastor. He was going to be driving us off for some work that day, and I got in his car with a chocolate chip muffin early in the morning, and he looked at me with kind of that, ugh, Americans, look to his face, right? And he explained to me very kindly that in Scotland, people only eat at tables and only with others. What? Whoa. And I'd been there for a while already and I thought, I have not even noticed this. 
What a beautiful image. That's how it's supposed to be. Not only healthy for our bodies to eat that way, but healthy spiritually. We're not meant to do our Christianity by ourselves, right? We're, we're meant to gather and to eat together. What about an image of the kid's table? So some family gatherings have um, kids off to the side doing their own thing. Some churches have kids off to the side doing their own thing and not really part of the congregation. I think we do a great job here at Orchard, including children. But are there other groups that we might be just kind of thoughtlessly excluding? Are we making anyone feel less than? Or maybe not made to feel less than, but they do feel less a part of the church. Something to, to think about for us. That Jesus invites all believers to his table. So how do we get the word out to everyone that there's a place for each person at the Lord's table? Another image. Okay, this one I saw on social media. Anybody seen this? <laughs> Talk about an unworthy manner. June, are we going to be getting pumpkin spice? It's the season. So I have heard my kids discussing communion bread, you know, weird pastor's kids at home. This is when they were little. They're discussing their preferences between sourdough, French bread, Hawaiian bread. You know, what's it going to be for communion? Um, and they also were discussing just how tasty Jesus should be. I don't know. We can get caught up on things that are not meant for us to be caught up on. When I was a little middle schooler, my youth pastor used to take me to visit homebound people and share communion with them. And one day he called running late and he said, Mindy, because that was my name back then. He said, Mindy, I'm running late. Can you get some bread ready for communion? I'm holding the phone like this because this is what they used to look like. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have any communion bread at my house. What are you thinking? He's like, anything. I'm like, I have Wonder Bread. And he said, perfect. Take a, take a piece of Wonder Bread and cut it into squares. And then when, I, when he came, I saw that he had Welch's grape juice. My mind was blown that we were serving Wonder Bread and Welch's grape juice. <laughs> because it's not what the elements that are made of that make it important. It's the meaning behind it. Jesus used whatever was in front of him on his table, the wine and the bread. And the holiness is that Jesus is present with us. That we are gathering together with him. That we are also gathered with all the believers in every time and space when we gather at the table. Maybe a more worthy image for us is a potluck. Maybe not the food part of the potluck, but everyone bringing something spiritually. We've all been gifted spiritually. So maybe communion is more when we bring something to the table, not just come and watch the show, but we bring ourselves and we encourage one another as we are nourished together in the meal. Well, verse 28 says, everyone ought to examine themselves. Today is world communion, and how powerful would it be if every Christian in every church would examine ourselves? If we tried to right some wrongs, to apologize, make peace, start fresh, get clean, Reset as we come together to commune with God and with one another. Before we have communion, we're going to have a few minutes where we get to reflect on our lives and on our, our relationship with Jesus and with one another. And I encourage you, if you want to jot down a few names that come to mind of people who might need an apology from you, maybe of arguments where you might need to listen a little bit more to the other side. Maybe someone who needs your forgiveness. Communion is a refresh. We can't fix everything by ourselves, and that's actually the point of Jesus. 
We can't make ourselves worthy, but we can come to the table knowing that Jesus has. Communion is serious business. The Apostle Paul took the time to teach and reteach and probably reteach and reteach because it was so important. And Jesus himself in his big mom voice said, do this. This is his meal, his table, and he's calling all of us to come. In a few minutes, you'll be invited to come with a repentant heart, ready to fellowship with Jesus and with these brothers and sisters and mindful of all of our brothers and sisters around the world. Amen. So friends, as Melinda mentioned, we're going to take just a couple of minutes to quiet our hearts and our minds before God. It's an opportunity to give over anything that might stand in the way, maybe to forgive someone, to seek forgiveness for ourselves, and to be at peace. Friends, this is the Lord's table. And Jesus invites everyone to put their faith in him and to come to this table and to share in this meal. And we don't come to this table out of a sense of pride or even a sense of worthiness. We come to this table because we know that we need Jesus. Because this bread and this cup are the visible signs of God's invisible grace, a grace that is ours because Jesus died for us on the cross. This is the call for us to come now and to share in this meal. Pray with me. Loving God, we pray for our world, for peace everywhere especially where wars rage. We pray for unity to stand against poverty and injustice. We pray for our own nation. Help us to be united and to remember how to be kind, how to be respectful of one another. We pray for the church, Lord, here and everywhere. Fill your people with faith that makes a difference, not just in their lives, but in the world. Bless with your comfort all who are troubled and in pain. Heal the sick. Console those who mourn. Provide for those who are in need. And Lord, use us to do these things as your hands and feet wherever we are able. Lord, prepare our hearts now to receive communion. We pray that you would forgive our sin that you would open our hearts to receive your grace. May this be a spiritual moment. Renew our faith. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it was on that night 2,000 years ago as Jesus sat at the table of the Passover meal that he took the bread of that meal and he blessed it and he broke it and he said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body given for you, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, Jesus took the cup of that meal and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you take this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And as we just heard the Apostle Paul say, every time we take this bread, every time we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ 
until he comes again. As you receive communion again this morning, you're going to come up one of the aisles. A server will hand you the bread with the tongs. You'll take the cup um, in your own hands, receive your communion, return back to the seats. There's going to be a gluten-free station to my left, a self-serve station with the pre-packaged communion to your right. And a special note that there's going to be some video of, of pictures on the screens while we take communion. And they're pictures of people taking communion all over the world to remind us again that God's call is to everyone all over this globe. So would the servers please come forward. So I invite you to come. Please stand and sing with us our closing song and very appropriate song. We need him, don't we? We need God in our lives. We need him to encourage us, to heal us, to love us, to forgive us. Lord, I come. understand Jesus, both the seriousness and the joyfulness of knowing what it means to be rescued by him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.